Senior and I'm the co-director of the Purai Global Indigenous History Centre um, and today I'm talking to James Ballangari and James is going to talk about yarning and we're going to start with just the basics about yarning. What is a yarn? So uh, a yarn essentially is is collaborative dialogue. Mm -hmm. You know it's having two people who are connecting on something, sharing on something and then being able to convert that towards a direction where you can make sense and understanding of a certain topic. Um, yarning, it's, it's quite different to, to other types of data collection. You know, yes. Sometimes, sometimes... I was going to ask you, how's that different from an interview? Yeah, so uh, an interview typically, you know, there's a, there's a list of questions mm -hmm. and the, the interviewer is quite passive. They'll ask the questions yeah. and they'll receive the information. With a yarn, uh, there is no title of an interviewer. Yeah. You know, they're just as part of the yarn as the participant is. You know, it's, it's collaboration and it's not a verbatim question. You yeah. Know, you have to cater the, the question to uh, the people involved in the yarn. Yeah. You know, you have to be a lot more accessible in your wording. So you, you might not use formal wording, you might use, you know, what we call layman's terms or yeah. just everyday speak and terminology. And um, it's... It's one of those things where the person facilitating has to first share a part of themselves, mm -hmm. uh, which allows the space and the potential for the participants to share a part of themselves. Yeah, and is it, is it that aspect? I think there must be more aspects, but it's more than a conversation too, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's more than a conversation. Uh, a, a conversation kind of has, has a much clearer purpose and direction. Mm -hmm. Your yarn can go anywhere, yeah, and that's why it's uh, to facilitate a yarn. It's it's definitely an art form. Yeah. So, what are the key skills of a facilitator of a yarn? What what skills do you need to have? I think you you have to be able to uh, be personable. You have to be able to um, socialise mm -hmm. and and be vulnerable. Yeah. And be open to that. Um, yeah. So a lot of people would be quite nervous about being vulnerable like putting themselves into that sort of position it's really tricky honestly it's really tricky we're so used to putting on that professional hat mm. and the very kind of formal uh, ways that we we speak and we conduct ourselves uh, but when we actually do that in a yarn it has the opposite effect it gets you further away from the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve yeah that's really interesting and I suppose listening is a key skill of a facilitator too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and it's, it's active listening and it's mm. making sense and understanding of, of what's going on. So uh, you get different forms of communication. Um, it's, it's about understanding the cultural nuances of mm. Indigenous people and who are a part of the yarn. And that's a, it takes a long time. Mm. It takes a long time. And, and uh, what you find when people are first learning how to yarn, especially in the, the research space, is they will hear something and they'll have a direct assumption of what it is but they might be uh, might be pretty pretty far off mm. because it's all around uh, context it's all around those cultural nuances and understandings yeah and often people do forget to listen when they're doing this sort of interaction they're so focused on getting the the information they're forgetting to listen so that's a really important skill yeah exactly and uh, the thing is with the yarn um, at it doesn't fit the Western uh, structures of time. Mm. You know, a lot of Western structures of time <laughs> is by the clock, by the minute, yeah. uh, by the hour, by the second. Um, and to do a yarn properly, you have to go what we call, um, you know, we call Koori time mm -hmm. here in uh, New South Wales, Victoria. Some people call it Murray time. And it's actually a lot more similar to uh, other cultures. Like I've, I've been to Hawaii and uh, native Hawaiians call it Hawaiian time. Mm. We used yeah. to have Northern Territory time. Yep, yep. I've, I've met a few friends from uh, Africa that call it African time. Yep. <laughs> you know, it's the understanding that things happen when they happen and when they mm. happen when they're supposed to happen. Yep. And we're not bound by the hands of the clock. Yep, yep. And it takes a lot of getting used to for people who are not used to that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And that's why I, I suggest to anybody, if you're making time for a yarn, whatever, whatever time you've set aside that you think you would normally take <laughs> to do it, almost double it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because you have to have a period um, beforehand 
to get to know each other mm. and to connect on different things. Yeah, that's really important. And that that's a sort of really good lead into what I was going to ask you about next, which was, you know, how do you set up a yarn? What do you need to think about when you're establishing this? Um, it's, it's really difficult because, um, again, it's, it's the taking of, of that professional hat off. Mm. It's about connection. It's not about connection on the professional level. It's not about um, knowing somebody as an acquaintance. You know, it's a lot of um, connecting on a personal level, connecting on a social level and, and truly mm. understanding who the person is that you're yarning with, mm. but also um, making sure that the first thing you do is show them who you are so they truly understand your mm. intentions and your intentions are pure, yeah. your, your intentions are authentic and um, that there is a relationship already established mm. uh, before um, you even approach them yeah. down. Yeah, so a lot of the work is in the, in the initiation stages rather than the yarn itself. Exactly, exactly. The, um, the yarn is, is essentially, um, I wouldn't like to say the, the spiritual peak because it's a, it's, it's a continuation of a, of a journey and a relationship mm. that kind of never ends. Yeah. Um, if, if your relationship with the participants end after the yarn, then it was never authentic in the first yep, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to know. Yeah, and what do you do with the information from a yarning session? How what's the how do you analyze it? So um, it sounds quite complex. Yeah, no, it yeah. is. It is quite complex, especially when uh, indigenizing your know, research practices is quite new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's actually an exploratory process at the moment, and it's it's being led by a lot of great indigenous researchers. Uh, even then, we have the challenge of how do we create the space within the system to take off our professional hat and put on our community hat mm -hmm. and then be able to bring who we are and who we've um, grown up to become in community, how do we bring that into the research space? Yeah. Um, one thing that I've found is that you can't assume... Um, you can't assume the findings and the outcomes prior to the no. analysing. And um, you have to find a way that when you're looking at, say, transcripts, that the transcripts aren't just words on a paper. Mm. You know, they, they carry the essence and they carry uh, the energy of the yarn at the time. Yeah. So if, you're, if you find yourself very sluggish and like, oh, paperwork then you're probably not in the right state to analyse mm. these uh, transcripts effectively to get the essence and the true understanding of what the participants are yeah. saying. And are you looking to draw out all the voices from that in that process? Um, well, it, it, depends on, uh, it depends on what you're trying to achieve and, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, your ethics processes. Yeah. Because some topics and some voices are very sensitive. Yes. And some things should not be shared. Yeah. And some things should be kept in the confidentiality of the project. But yeah. also, um, when you speak about Indigenous knowledges, um, you know, in a lot of senses, Indigenous knowledges are sacred mm -hmm. and they're not supposed to be s shared with everybody. So that's another set of skills for facilitator is to keep that yarn sort of contained, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. And make sure that what is shared is appropriate to be shared. Yeah, and it's a real challenge because a lot of times in... Um, in Western understandings of knowledge, it's knowledge is for everybody, knowledge mm. is to be shared. Whereas um, with Indigenous understandings of knowledge, as I said, knowledge is sacred. And you have certain knowledge holders, knowledge keepers who have uh, the right to um, share knowledge if they choose to mm. and the right at to the say, right time. At the right time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but also to say to somebody, this is for you mm. and you cannot share this. Yes. You yeah. know, so it's about. Um, it's about respecting those understandings of knowledges and that if you're using yarning methodology and if your intentions are pure and authentic, that regardless of whether you think the outcome is going to be better, the, the rights, the understandings, the knowledges and uh, the sacred philosophies of the Aboriginal people come first. Yeah, great. And just a final question. Is it possible for non-Indigenous people to be involved in yarning? I believe so. It, it takes it takes a lot of uh, a lot of time. As mm -hmm. I said, it's it's 
cultural understanding of yeah. nuances. And can non-Indigenous people learn through that process as well? Do you think it's a could, could be a learning tool? Yeah, yeah I mean, honestly, it, it can be. In, in the past, I, I, I didn't believe so mm. um, until a, a friend of mine uh, was speaking about 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 the use of a Indigenous uh, teaching methods by mm. non-Indigenous people, and um, I realised that it's a process mm. and we have to allow that process to happen yeah. but we have to uh, do this best we can to mitigate any negative effects that we may be unaware of. I mean we are very much um, still in the start of indigenizing research practices mm. so our non-indigenous colleagues have a lot of growth mm-hmm. um, and a lot of learning and they, they have to come along to that journey with us Yes, and it's, it's quite difficult and it's not going to be smooth and mm. it's, it's going to be bumpy and there's going to be um, ups and downs and rough patches and some mistakes are going to be made and but that's how we get better yeah we we can't jump from the start to the finish line and um, we have to make sure that this journey and this process is led by indigenous researchers yeah, absolutely and it's it's guided by indigenous researchers yeah. and it's and that's Indigenous researchers who are deeply embedded in their community, their culture, and their understanding of what it is to be Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. Fantastic. Thank you so much, James. That sounds like like the beginning of an amazing story, in a sense. So like this yarn that just got, keeps on going on and, um, you know, will inform research practice, you know, here at the university, but everywhere. Thank you. You're welcome.